Hello, this is the first of our last set of three uh, videos for Bible Survey to wrap up the semester. So what we're going to do in this video is just look at a handful of passages from Paul's letters, uh, particularly passages that introduce kind of key themes or key words or concepts that appear throughout Paul's letters. We're not going to look at them exhaustively, um, but want to highlight just these four different terms and, and ways in which they they kind of show up and, and then also um, want one additional idea on top of that. Okay, so to kick us off, I'm just going to kind of hop around between these terms, between these concepts. The first term uh, that I want us to focus on, and I, I've made a little sign for us, is the Greek word charis. Uh, which symbolizes, which means grace or mercy or gift. So charis, grace, mercy, gift. Um, this is, if, if there's any idea that Paul, Pauline theology, Paul's ideas, you know, are, are really centered upon, it is, it is this idea of grace. Um, one of the key ideas that Paul kind of develops throughout several letters is this idea that we, we do not earn God's favor or God's mercy or we do not earn salvation through our behavior. Like it is not a matter of merit that we work hard enough and, and if we do enough good works and it somehow outweighs any bad you know things we do or sins that we commit, that somehow if, if, you know, if we get an 88 on the test of life, in terms of doing good things, then God will allow us into heaven. If we get us, you know, fifty nine, then we're going to go to hell or something like that. But but he he has this idea of God's mercy. God's mercy. God gives us forgiveness. God gives us mercy. Now we've seen evidences of that throughout the Old Testament, right? I mean, Hesed really is kind of an Old Testament or Hebrew version of kind of the same idea that God's faithful love to Israel is in spite of their bad behavior. Like, and in, in, in it, it, their, their love, their place in God's covenant is not predicated or built upon um, their ability to keep the covenant, but, but God's mercy to them. So there's, there's hints of, for sure, of, of grace all throughout the Old Testament, but Paul really develops this idea. So I'm just going to read a, a couple passages that uh, kind of highlight this, and, and then we'll we'll move to the next term. So, um, so Paul in Romans, Paul has been talking about kind of all of us. Gosh, you know, Jew, Gentile, all of us are sinners. All of us fall short of perfection. All of us fall short of the measure that God would have for us. So, out of that, is there any hope for any of us? Right, because we're all hopelessly sinners. Um, and, and in Romans 3, he says this, There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned, and all fall short of the glory of God. But all are justified freely by his grace, by his charis, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. And atonement is this idea of making one or reconciling a relationship. You know, let me read that again. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace, by his mercy, right? So, so that's, that's kind of Paul articulating this idea. I want to jump over to Romans 5 and kind of repeat the concept for us here. Um, you see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, while we were still unable by our own efforts to do what God wanted, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? So... Again, going back to Hesed, you know, it's not a matter of if you do these things, then I will love you. But no, I have to love you. I have chosen to show you mercy, and that mercy cannot be stopped. That mercy is is unrelenting. It is the the Hesed love that I have for you? And, and here we see Paul developing that as well. God demonstrates his Hesed for us in this: 
While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of Jesus, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? All right, so, so this idea that because of our sinfulness, because of our brokenness, it is as if we were enemies of God from our end. But God refuses to treat us as enemies, but instead treats us with mercy and forgiveness, and that that is um, the pinnacle of that mercy is, is Christ's sacrifice for us, Jesus' sacrifice for us at the cross. Um, just going to read one more passage related to uh, this idea of mercy. Again, we could find this um, all throughout Paul's letters, but, but this is now jumping to Ephesians. For one time, we, all of us, were by nature, we were deserving of wrath. Like we deserved a, a just being, a just God who was in control of all things, had every right to look upon us with wrath. We were beings deserving of wrath, but because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Jesus, even when we were dead. And I'm going to come back to that alive in. That, that's a key idea. Um, but for it is by grace we have been saved through faith. And it is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God. By grace we have been saved through faith. It is not by our efforts, by our works, so that no one can boast, right? It is the free gift of God. So that that is that, that becomes kind of a central doctrine. Uh, you know, 1500 years later, Martin Luther in, in the, you know, in Germany in the 1500s is going to sort of rediscover this idea and highlight it yet again, kind of launching the Protestant Reformation. But the idea being that, that it is God's gr grace to us is free, unmerited gift, right? Like we, we do not do anything to deserve God's love, to deserve God's favor, to, to earn salvation, but it is given to us as gift. So that's this idea of, of charis, of gift, okay? Um, a second term that I want to talk about is an I, a term called kenosis. Okay, so I again made a little uh, sign for this. Kenosis, or self-emptying. Kenosis, self-emptying. And so here's where we see this playing out. So in, in the letter to the church in Philippi, um, Jesus, or Paul says this, and, and, and he's talking about first how we ought to act towards one another, but, but he anchors that in Jesus, and then he makes a very interesting and, and provocative statement that, well, let, let me read it, and then we'll comment on it. So he says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And this is, this is where kenosis comes into play. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or grasped onto. Rather, Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by coming, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So this passage that I, the, the last section there, kind of starting with the who being in very nature God, is sometimes called the Christ hymn. That's a term that you'll, you'll want to know um, for the final. The Christ hymn, if you read it in a Bible, it's kind of set off as, as if it's poetry as opposed to the, the words around it. And most scholars believe this is probably a, a, a very, very ancient um, example of the church worshiping, that this would have been a fragment of a hymn that Christians would have sung in early worship. It's unclear whether Paul wrote this hymn or if he's taking it and using it. You know, like if you were to write a paper 
and you go, well, you know, I think that what best describes this idea I'm trying to get across are the these song lyrics from Taylor Swift or, you know, these worship lyrics from Hillsong, you know, or something like that. And, and you put these song lyrics into your paper. Um, whether Paul composed this hymn or whether he's appropriating uh, a song, a piece of worship that the early church had had, most most scholars believe that that this little poem that kind of starts with this descent. Okay, so the first half is kenosis. That's what I read. So kenosis is like pouring out. I I I'm going to empty myself of who I am. Right, and, and so the poem is saying Jesus, who who could have been a, a being of glory, a, a being you know whom if we were to look upon. Um, look upon him, we, we would, you know, faint or die because of the, the ma ma majesty of his being. Rather than that, Jesus becomes a human. He lowers himself or empties himself to become a human. And then not only a human, but a human who serves others. So he empties himself even more, kind of the upside down kingdom. Remember, in, in God's kingdom, kings act like servants. The powerful serve the weak. So, you know, Jesus, who being in very nature, God empties himself to become a human, empties himself to become a servant, and then ultimately empties himself even further to die on the cross. So sometimes I've been trying to kind of symbolize this with my hands. Sometimes scholars, when they talk about it, see this poem as kind of these stair steps, you know, like kind of descending these canonic emptying acts becoming a human, becoming a servant, dying on a cross, kind of stepping down, emptying, emptying, emptying. But then the song doesn't end there. But kind of at, after reaching that low point of ultimate emptying, pouring himself out on the cross, he then begins to, you know, after the resurrection, he returns to glory. So kind of it's a stair step down and then back up again. Kind of as Jesus talked about, like, if you want to gain your life, right? If you want to be great, become less now, and then ultimately you will be honored and glorified for that. So we have this canonic arc, right? This, this Jesus pours himself out and empties himself. Here's why I think that's really, really a significant idea. And that's going to lead to a, another concept in just a moment. So I think most of us, when when we think of God, we think of God kind of being on a mountaintop somewhere or, or sitting in the sky, sitting on a throne, um, displaying incredible power. You know, like when you mention God's name, heavenly trumpets sound and, and you know, everyone bows down and, and, and that God is this, this unreachable, distant, powerful being, right? And then Jesus decides i'm gonna i'm gonna give that up for a while and go do this other thing go do this self-emptying thing okay so and 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 i think that's a very understandable kind of attitude to have way to think about things but i want to suggest something here and and to me this has become probably one of the most significant ideas about how i think about god um over the last 20 30 years um so, so Christians have this doctrine of the Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're going to come back to that in, in a moment. Um, but Father, Son, Holy Spirit are, are all parts of who God is, right? That somehow God is one God, monotheism, but also three beings within that, which, I mean, this is a confusing concept, a, a, a difficult way to think about this, Um one way I, I've heard of thinking about how can something be one thing and three things at once is, is to think about a, a, a musical notes, right? Like if I were to play a piano and hit a, a C, like a middle C, hit, hit the key on the piano, and you're like there's the middle C. But then I want to play a C chord, right? So a chord are the one note, C, but then other notes, two other notes that are in kind of harmonic relationship with that note, right? And so if I took three fingers and hit the piano at the same, you know, all three at the same time to play a C chord, 
what would happen would be, like if you would listen carefully, you could still hear that very first C that, that we originally played by itself, the monotheistic C, right? Bong, there's the note. But now we've played a chord, so this, the single note still is there. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit still exist as single notes. Like all three notes of the chord, if you listen carefully, you can find the lowest note, the highest note, and the middle note. Um, but they've also formed something new. They've formed a, a, what in music is called a chord, right? And, and they are in harmony with each other. So they are distinct, three things, but they're also a new single thing, this this chord. Chord. And this relationship that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have together is, is what makes up the Trinity. And, and so, um, kind of getting back to kenosis now. Now, Christians have this idea that, that Father, Son, Holy Spirit are perfectly consistent with one another. That's part of what makes, the, makes them one God, makes the, this perfect harmony, right? So what that means is, like I'm, if you were to meet my father um, and talk to us on the phone, like, like our voices sound quite similar, like, like when, especially when my father was younger, when I was in my 20s, like if, you know, someone would call our house and I was there and my dad was there, like you, people would have a hard time sometimes telling who they were talking to. Or if you even listen to our ideas, because I grew up in my parents' house I, I have similar ideas about the world in, in many ways to my father, but I'm not identical to him, right? There, there are distinct ways in which I think different things or I respond to situations differently. So I'm related to my father, but not identical to. In the Trinity, Christians believe that while there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are perfectly in union with one another which means that like the son doesn't just sometimes act similarly to the father, the son always does. That they have perfect, they share the same essence. So if, if there are a thousand situations where God the father were to encounter something and Jesus the son, 1,000 out of 1,000 times, they would have the exact same response. Not just similar responses, 80% of the time, but identical. That, that how Jesus acts, how Jesus responds to people, how Jesus um, lives his life is perfectly consistent to who the Father is. Okay, so that, that's a basic Christian belief. Probably if, if you've grown up in the church, you've heard of the Trinity before, you've maybe even heard that idea spelled out a little bit. Like, okay, sure, that makes sense. Here's why this is a big thing. So, so if we think God is, like God's essence is this glory, this power, this sitting on a throne somewhere, um, you know, demanding or expecting all creatures to kind of come and worship, um, then when Jesus acts in all these self-emptying kenosis kind of ways, that's, that's a surprise. Like, 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 that's acting out of, that would be acting out of character, right? That, that would be, like, for a period of time, Jesus chooses to do something that's not consistent with his personality. I'm going to act in these self-emptying ways, but really, I'm like God the Father, and, and I want to sit on the throne and have people serve me all day long. But for a little while, I'll go to earth and do this. Well, the, the idea of the Trinity is, well, that's, that's impossible, right? So, so here's where this is a big deal. Um, if Jesus does this, if this is how when God enters the world, God enters the world through kenosis, through emptying, through pouring God's self out, then what that suggests is that's God's basic personality, right? That the, the God the Father is not a God who sits distant and in glory, desiring to be served and worshipped, but, a, but a, that God the Father also is a God of kenosis. That the very nature of God is to empty God's self in love, to pour God's very essence out to love and to care for others. And I think that 
we could spend more time unpacking that. I'm not going to sit with that too much more at this point. But, but begin to think about that, I encourage you. It, it, like, think about all the ways in which um, we define power, all the ways in which we defined good or God, um, and, and how many of those are kind of tied up in, you know, pictures of power that look very worldly, pictures of power that look like an an army that can't be defeated or a ruler that cannot be questioned or um, somebody who, who demands that others serve them. And, and then think about this kenosis. Think about, well, what if not only did Jesus for 33 years live a life of self-emptying, what if by doing that, what Jesus is saying, this is who God is. The kind of God that made the world is a God of kenotic love, a God of who, who pours God's self out in love for others. We're going to return to that idea at the very end of, of this video. But I, but I want you to think about that. That may not seem like, okay, yeah, I get it, Steve. I'm not quite sure why you think this is such a big idea. But I promise you, if you allow that to kind of sink into your theology a bit, it really, really can be world-changing. It certainly has for me. Um, so another idea, and, and we alluded to this already um, from the um, from the Ephesians pas passage that we read. This idea that we are in Christ. Okay, so this is sort of the third term that that we are in Christ. In the book of Colossians, Paul will say that for all history, there's been this great mystery that angels, that, that all, all beings long to know what is the mystery of the universe. And here it is. Here's the, the, the secret to everything. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. Okay, so, so again, if, if you have grown up as a Christian, maybe all your life you've heard, like, invite Jesus into your heart. I believe that Christ God lives in me. And so for some of us that have grown up in the church, that, that's not, you know, like, oh, well, of course, you know, isn't that just the way it is? But think about that. I mean, think about what Paul is suggesting here. He is not suggesting that God lives out here somewhere and, and we try to follow God as best we can. We try to work as hard as we can to live up to who God is. I, here in this coronavirus time, there's I've, I've been watching a lot of ESPN, and, and and ESPN is doing. They just started last night a, a documentary series on Michael Jordan um, and, and the Chicago Bulls. And Michael Jordan, you know, was, was almost certainly the the greatest basketball player that has ever lived. This unbelievably talented, driven basketball player, right? And so, say I want I want to be like Michael Jordan as a basketball player. So what what I would have to do is. Um, a, be born again with a completely different athletic giftedness than I have. But given who I am, I'm, I'm trying to be like Michael Jordan, right? So I would I would watch videos of, of how he learned how to play basketball, and I would copy that. I would try to dress like Michael Jordan. I would, If I were shooting a basketball, I would try to shoot it as best I can like Michael Jordan. I, I don't jump very well, I would try to, okay, how can I improve my athleticism to become, you know, a better jumper so that I could, I could dunk a basketball like Michael Jordan came. But I would be limited profoundly by the fact that I am not Michael Jordan. You know, like where he, he could leap 40 inches off the ground, I can jump 10, 12, you know, like, whereas he had this incredible speed and eye-hand coordination I don't. I move kind of like molasses and, and I'm fairly clumsy. Right? So my efforts to emulate Michael Jordan are always going to be woefully short. Right? Just as, just as our, our efforts to imitate God, our efforts to live like Jesus, to look like Jesus, like even if we hung out with Jesus every single day, and like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be as loving as that guy is. I'm gonna be as gentle and patient and kind as Jesus is. Yeah, but I'm kind of a bastard, really, when you get down to it, you know. And, and day after day, I, I just fail. I can't do it. I can't be it. So part of what Paul is suggesting is this new thing that rather than our efforts to somehow 
you know, follow or align with or measure up with a God, a, a Jesus that is inaccessible to us. That God has come and dwells in us. You know, that, that part of the mystery of Christ's life on earth, death, resurrection, returning to heaven, is that now the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, comes and doesn't just guide us. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would show up periodically and, and guide people, would, would give advice, would, would, would move events in certain ways. But now this idea that the Holy Spirit actually comes and dwells in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that somehow when one becomes a Christian, one becomes indwelt by the Spirit of God in a way that begins to change us. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says that if we are in Christ, we are being transformed into God's likeness. Right? That somehow, magically, I am not just failing hopelessly in my efforts to become as good at basketball as Michael Jordan is, but somehow, if Michael Jordan were the Holy Spirit, that somehow Michael Jordan has come and, and is dwelling in me and slowly transforming me into a being that can do what Michael Jordan does. In this case, into a being that can love like Jesus loves, that can, that can relate to God like Jesus relates to God. And this idea, um, the early Christians had a term for it called theosis, or participating in the life of God. That somehow um, what Jesus makes available to us is not just forgiveness that, that we, okay, you're going to still live your totally human life, and when you die, you know, that'll, that'll be that, but that somehow, no, we participate in God's life, that we, um, that God welcomes us. If the Trinity is a dance, sometimes people describe Father, Son, Holy Spirit kind of holding hands for all eternity in this dance, and, and I'm going to give you a term for that in just a second, that what theosis suggests is that the Trinity kind of opens up, you know, like picture a square dance or a circle dance or something, and 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 like, oh, do you want to join in? And and let's make room for you. And they open their hands and and allow us to enter in, and that we then join the dance of God's love. You, you know, um, the fourth term for the day is this term term perichoresis, God's relationship of love in the Trinity. So if theosis is we participate in God, what is it that we're participating in? Perichoresis, this perichoretic love. And, and so I'm going to kind of bring a few of these terms together now. So what is, what is perichoresis? What does that look like? So imagine um, two, three beings two, that are in relationship and they're all defined by kenosis, right? Like that every morning I get up and all I think about all day is how can I pour myself out to love my wife? You know, and, and, and my wife also, she is a canonic lover. Like, like she wakes up every moment, every morning going, how can I pour myself out today to love Steve, to love my husband? And, and, and that so all day long, each of us are, are just what can I do to help you? How can I serve you? How can I pour myself out to, to make you um, happier, to make you better? But then I'm never emptied. It's not like, oh, at the end of the day, I, I, I've given so much of myself away that I'm empty because my spouse is always pouring herself into me. And, and that so I'm always emptying, but never empty. I'm always pouring out, but always being filled. And perichoresis is the idea that that's what the Trinity is doing for all eternity. That the Father is pouring himself out in love toward the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Son is pouring himself out to the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to the Father and the Son. And, and it's just kind of like, I'm always, do, do I have any money? I've got, I, I've got a five in each pocket, you know, like, and I'm always giving this five dollars to the Son. You know, son, giving five dollars to the Holy Spirit, but now I'm, but I'm not out of money because they're in turn saying, "Well, I happen to have five dollars too, and and let me give it to you." And and so, we're they're always emptying, always being filled, always pouring out in love, always being filled in love, and that's this perichoresis. So when when Christians would talk about 
kind of participating in Christ, that, 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 that Christ is in us, that somehow, uh, maybe another image of this, if, if this love is kind of like an electrical current, right, you know, that, that is always flowing from Father to Son to Holy Spirit, this, this emptying love is just this energy, this flow going from one to another, one to another. Um, and if you were to take hold of, you know, two electrodes, right, you know, that, that are live wires, that electricity is going to pass through you. With electricity, well, that might, well, kill you, right? You know, if you're struck by lightning and passes from the ground to the sky and, and it goes through your body. But in this case, it's this beautiful sense of participating in God's love. That, that we don't only look at it or try to model ourselves after it from a distance, but that somehow the dance opens up and we are able to join in and that the love of God flows through and in us, you know, from Father to Son to Holy Spirit, but also from us out to others. And, and that as we try to live lives following God, we're not just doing it on our own efforts. We're not just trying the best we can to somehow be slightly better versions of ourselves today than we were yesterday, but but that God has, as 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 is dwelling in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So these are those the, these four terms, okay. So th those are four big ideas that Paul kind of introduces and develops. They become really significant in Christianity as time goes on. Uh, and two other ideas. Uh, that I, I just want to leave us with. Um, one is is sometimes called the universal Christ, right? So, so did, did Jesus come just to help individuals, right? Did Jesus die uh, on the cross just to save this sinner, that sinner? You know, like, let's go through the room one by one. You know, mm -hmm. is, is salvation, is God's work in the world just about individuals? It certainly is about individuals. But the concept of kind of the universal Christ uh, suggests that, that, that Jesus is, is more than that. That Jesus is, that God's work in the world through Jesus is much more than just the salvation of individual souls. And, and to illustrate that, I, I want to read a passage from Colossians and then uh, refer to, to one in 2 Corinthians as well. So the Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation, for in him, Jesus, all things were created, right? So here's the universal Christ at creation. Um, everything that is made, Jesus participated in its creation, right? For through Jesus, all things were created. Jesus was with God in the beginning. Things on heaven, things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Jesus and for him. He, is, he was before all things, and in Jesus all things hold together. So that's kind of a statement at, at this point about things past, right? About, about what has gone on in the past. But here, here in, first, in, in Colossians 1, 19 and 20, he says this, For God was pleased to have all of God's fullness dwell in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to God all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let me, let me read that again. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile to God all things, whether things on hev in heaven or things on earth. Um, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So, so what this is suggesting is that, that God's saving work is not just about, do you know where you're going to go to heaven when you die? It is about that, but it's about so much more. Um, think about this, this time with the coronavirus, you know, living in a world where this, this tiny thing that we cannot even see is... is, is you know, bringing death and destruction and wreaking havoc to economies and individuals' lives and all around the world. That, that in Christ, Paul is saying, that eventually will be wiped away. That in Christ, um, all the things that are broken, all the things that are not shalom, 
right? If the story of God started with shalom, everything perfect, everything as it should be, and that all kind of fell apart in Genesis 3 and what follows, that, that what Jesus is about is not just giving us an escape hatch, like I'm just going to let this world go to hell, but I'm going to, if you're a Christian, I'm going to pull, you know, individual Christians out and you have an escape hatch or an escape clause, but saying, no, in Christ, everything is being reconciled to God. Everything is being renewed. Second Corinthians says, in Christ, there is a new creation. All things. In Christ, God was reconciling all things to himself. Um, that, that Yes, our individual salvation is a part of what God's work is, but the universal Christ or the cosmic Christ idea from Paul suggests that, that it's so much bigger than that, right? That, that all the things that are broken in our world, all the things that are non-shalom, that, that, you know, violence, um, environmental crises, uh, droughts, hurricanes, floods, diseases, that Christ is, is, is eliminating all of that, that ultimately, ultimately, already, but not yet. I mean, remember that, like it started, but it's not finished yet. But that ultimately what Christ is going to bring about is the renewal and, and restoration of all things. Not just some Christians will escape and, and everything else will just continue to fall apart and be destroyed, but that ultimately Christ will renew all things. And, and in the last video of the week, when we look at the book of Revelation, we're going to see that as well. Uh, that's going to be a different author, but, but a return to the same theme. Um, kind of one final idea for today it sort of overarches uh, quite a bit of Paul's ideas, is, is this idea that, um, that Christ is still alive in the world through us. Now, like we already talked in this video a little bit about Christ in us, right? This is the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling in us. The idea I want to talk about here is slightly different than that. And, and really, Paul starts to talk about the church, right? That in some real way, if Christ is in us, then we... And if Christ is in the Trinity, a, a Trinity of relations, right? Like to be God is to be God in love, God in relation. That then to be Christians, to be the body of Christ, is, is to be people who together continue Jesus' life in the world, right? That, we, that church is not just a place where Christians come and remember some great things that happened in the past. It's not a historical society. The, the church is not a place where we, we just sit around and tell stories about the good old days and, and this our hero, Jesus, and, and the great things he has done, he did in the past. But that really Christ's life lives on as we uh, flesh out kind of Jesus's life in the world, both in how Christians love each other. You know, so, so Paul will talk in, in 1 Corinthians, there's this extend, extended conversation about you are the body of Christ. And some of you have different body parts. Like fingers don't do the same things that ears do. Ears don't do the same thing that eyes do. And, and so we have different gifts. Some people are gifted at speaking. Some people are gifted at teaching or serving. And that's fine because you need fingers, just like you need ears, just like you need eyes. You need a pancreas, just like you need a heart. You need elbows, the same as you need collarbones, right? And, and, and that, that the body of Christ has a place for everyone. And that everyone comes together and, and that Jesus' body in the world is not complete without all the parts, right? So, so that none of us are irrelevant. None of us are left out. You know, none of us are more or less important. You know, he'll say in First Corinthians, like, the mouth is no good if, if there's no feet. <laughs> you know, like, where, you know, if, if, if only the body of Christ are people that can preach and teach, well, then, then what happens with the need for hands, the need for feet, the need, you know, like, so that all of us, all of us have a key part to play in the body of Christ. And we're also related to that, is is that Christ is the breaker break the the one who breaks down barriers between people, right? 
so that you don't have, well, we're feet and, and we have, we just like to hang out with other feet and we have nothing to do with ears. They're ridiculous and kind of hideous and bizarre and they stick out at people's heads and they look strange. We hate, we hate them. You know, like over and over again, Paul talks about that in Christ, um, God is bringing people together, removing barriers. There's n neither slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. And that's not saying that, that ethnic diversity disappears or that gen male and female disappears in Christ. But he's saying, but those, the, those things as barriers, as separation disappears. You know, in Christ, you know, clean and unclean, Jew and Gentile, that's gone. Rich and poor, that's gone. Slave and free, gone. Male and female, you know, patriarchy, that's gone. You know, that, that what Christ is doing is removing barriers and reconciling people together. That just as God in the Trinity is this perfect relational love without separation, that that is what we can be too and that we're called to that. So those are just a few ideas from Paul. Um, there's, there's so much more. I mean, Paul's letters are very rich and, and there's a lot we can glean from them, but that kind of gets us started for the week.